This is episode 34 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Pamela Jeffers. Pamela is the co-founder and program director for Natural Freedom Wellness Center. She has more than 40 years of experience working with horses, including training, coaching, instructing, hosting clinics, and competing. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Therapeutic Recreation and a Master of Science in Recreation Management from Ohio University. Pamela is a Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship International Certified Therapeutic Riding Instructor and an Equine Specialist for Mental Health and Learning. She also holds a certificate in Trauma-Focused Equine-Assisted Psychotherapy. She combined her educational background with her interest to explore the mind, body, and spirit connection with the horse when she opened Natural Freedom Wellness Center in Albany, Ohio in 2006. Pamela has co-authored a chapter in one of the first professional resource books for equine-assisted counseling and has recently completed her own book, Stand Up, A Journey of Finding Strength, which leads to a unique model of practice in exploring relationship with the self, horse, and others. Now, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Show. I'm Carly Cade, and today I am so excited to have fellow equine author Pamela Jeffers on the show. Hi, Pamela. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me. This is amazing. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, so Pamela and I met for the first time at the last Equus Film Festival, and I see your Winnie Award there over your shoulder next <laughs> to your books. So, you know, I always love to start out these interviews with a conversation about how uh, your love affair with horses began. Can you tell us a little bit about when horses came into your life and maybe your heart horse? <laughs> <laughs> um, interestingly enough, um, my mom and I had this conversation. How did it get started? And because it's been so long standing that um, we actually, mom's mom told me, she goes, you never like dolls. You just, you know, from the, from the starting gate, you always, it was always about horses. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, that was part of my childhood and they didn't understand where it came from because there was not a, a horse background in our family, but it was there deep and early. Um, and so they, they, they fostered it. They did the best they could and they did a really good job of, you know, sending me to horse camp and uh, riding lessons, kind of, I think somewhat thinking that maybe it would filter out and just kind of settle out and we'd move on. However, it didn't. Um, And we, (laughs) we just kind of kept plugging along. And finally, they said, all right, if you really want this, as long as you can save half the money for your horse, then you can, um, then we'll, then we'll do that. Um, we'll, we'll buy your horse. Um, but you have to put the time and the effort into it because they wanted to see if I was really serious. Mm-hmm. Um, so mind you, I was eight or 10 at this point and um, there's very limited opportunities or, you know, what, do you, what does an eight or 10 year old do to, to raise money? I, I did all kinds of creative things that way. Um, did a, a paper route. Um, however, the, the best story is I call it nickels to penny. And what it was, was back then the pop bottles had a five, five cent deposit. And so you would keep your pop bottle and that, that would, you would take it back and you'd get cash back. Well, we lived on the, um, I, I'm from Tippin, Ohio, and we lived real close to the city park. So every night after school, I would go over and I would go dumpster diving and, and gather these pop bottles and collect them and stick them into the corner of the garage. My parents did not know I was doing this um, until my my dad 
worked as a computer programmer in a factory on the other side of the of the park and one day his his um, peers his co-workers came over and, and kind of was giving this talk about how hard it is to raise four kids and if he was struggling you know they they're there to help and he was really confused and baffled and said I have no idea what you're talking about um, and they said well we see your youngest daughter dumpster diving in in the Hedges Boyer Park every single day and we're worried she's hungry and so he came home that night and said I had enough money and I didn't need to do that anymore as long and they would buy a horse if I promised never to dumpster dive again and I lived up to that promise to this day <laughs> so we bought a uh, grade standard quarter mix um, horse Penny is her name so it's nickels to pennies I love the story that you just shared because it's it's so great because when you're when parents do something like that you know raise half the money or you know uh, have chores or what have you to 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 do that I really think that it um, creates responsibility but also like this entrepreneurial uh, vibe in young kids because I love all the things that you said that you took on because you were so committed to having a horse and and then you you did the paper route but then what was most inventive was uh, picking up the bottles in the park. <laughs> I think that's really inventive. I, I grew up in Michigan, actually, so we had a 10 cent deposit on bottles, and I used to do the same thing for for horse, you know, horse expenses or what have you. You know, it's like you take them back and you come out with you know twenty dollars. That's pretty exciting. So I, totally, I totally get that world. That is so exciting. And then I love that her name was Penny, and it kind of you know matched up with your whole journey and 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 having her. And I'm so like you. You know, it's like you're born with it. We didn't have horses in my family. My parents didn't understand where it came from. I never wanted the Barbies or, or the dolls that went with the, I only wanted the horses that, you know, came with the Barbies. So I had all those, but I didn't have the dolls. It's just, it's so funny. It's so interesting too, how sometimes our stories are similar. And, and that's what I love so much about doing this show. It's like talking with other horse lovers and we just yeah. born, we're born with it. Who knows where it comes from. And so you've been loving horses, involved with horses for the majority of your life, finding ways to afford horses. And then, you know, in your, in your adult life, uh, you know, you, you started up Natural Freedom Wellness Center. Can you talk to mm -hmm. us a little bit about how that first horse led you into what you're doing now and what, what the Natural Freedom Wellness Center is and what, what do you do there? Okay. Um, well, Penny led me to this um, because when I was in 4-H, um, one of our projects, uh, my 4-H advisor had, had started a therapeutic riding program mm. and um, she needed some horses that we could, this was back in way many years ago, so the, the standards are different, the programs are different, but um, she asked if I would be interested in, in getting Penny ready for wheelchairs and that kind of thing because we had just been had a, a really solid bond. Um, I did a lot with her, so she was used to a lot of things. So we got her prepared for this new program, and it really resonated with me. Um, you know, the the power, healing power with of horses, and um, so while I was in a high school kid we were involved in that program I went on to college and that kind that stayed with me and I ended up doing a, a, my degree is in recreation therapy because of that program so Penny kind of actually started the entire my entire professional um, education and professional career uh, so it, my master's thesis was was actually on uh, the effects of horseback riding for cerebral palsy so that led to this uh, so yeah penny was the start of it so natural freedom we provide equine facilitated learning and therapy program that um, is either for treatment, for competence building, empowerment, relaxation, um, all the things that we, we experience to help our own family get through some of these difficult times, we now offer to our clients here at Natural Freedom. So we provide equine facilitated learning and therapy program. Why don't we talk a little bit about your book, which is behind you, called uh, Stand Up, which is a memoir. So, so talk to us a little bit about the book, you know, why did you decide to write such a personal memoir about this experience that you went through? So the book is about the events of seven, gener or seven governmental 
agencies uh, stepped on our family farm. Our, we have a, we're on a fifth generation family farm and they required us to go through a, a program um, that ended up taking a lot of financial um, resources to complete. Mm. And in that process, then we lost um, our, we had six rental properties. We were in foreclosure twice. Um, and we went from living a traditional, not, you know, middle class, low, you know, low to middle. I mean, but we were making it and we were doing well. Um, we went from that experience to um, basically looking at being homeless, trying to figure out where we were, we were going to turn our four horse trailer into a, a space to live for family of four, which try to try to wrap your brain around that. <laughs> the premise of the book is we can't change the events of our life, but we can change what we can do with them. You mentioned that like the government had something to do with the situation that you wound up in. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit more? You said you lost some of your properties and then, you know, cause I'm like, I'm trying to envision this. You're on this, you know, five, five generation farm, you, you know, you're doing well in life. You have horses, like how, what I'm, I know the book probably goes into this, but just to give a, a little bit more context for people listening into the interview, like what, how did this, what happened? Like, how did, how did, you know, something that was going well, like end up in a, in a place where you were thinking about living in a four horse trailer with your family and where the heck were you going to put your horses? Like, what, whoa, like that's a, that's a big deal. It, it is. The first two agencies that came knocking on our door, um, apparently there was a lawsuit years previously. Um, there was a coal mine in the area that had spillage and it went into the, uh, the a creek in our that runs directly through our um, at the time it was 1400 acres it run, ran through and the um, the defense of the coal mine company was that it wasn't they didn't pollute the the creek it was the farm industry that along that creek oh. so um, that's now I this is unbeknownst to my husband and I because it happened many many years ago um, the coal mine lost and they were they they were fined and what we've been told is it was 3.2 million dollars sitting in our county and it was supposed to um, help the the farmers in the region to kind of you know they were given back to the to the county but the chaos part was it became fine money then it became the agencies i my perspective is there was there was a juggling of who really had the jurisdiction of the money and in that middle of that juggling act was our family of you know and so one day it would be we had to meet the spec specifications of like odnr and then the next day it would be fish and wildlife and the next day it would be another agency so each day we were getting inundated with various different specifications that um because what they wanted us to do was get rid of our our um current dairy farm my husband was a dairy farmer and there was a dairy facility along that that creek and they wanted to, to get rid of that and and we had to build a new facility up the hill away mm -hmm. from the creek as a result um so we built three buildings it took them five years and by the seventh year we were we were looking at being homeless so I understand That's how it happens. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. So this 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 all stems from legal proceedings and then requirements to protect the creek that was running through the property. And then you know some of the even though the coal mine was responsible, some of some of the uh, outcomes from that case ended up affecting you, where you had to move things and build new things and, right. and spend money that you weren't planning on on spending. Exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. and then you weren't getting any of the settlement money because that was supposed to be you didn't that know was, where it was right? that was that, a count that was a county money and so mm -hmm. yeah but eventually it, it it left the county so okay but it was intended but, to rehab that polluted creek correct mm -hmm. okay I, that's my wow. understanding yeah so that is like so this is that's just something that happened to you and, the, and you weren't doing anything wrong and then the outcome was that it affected you and your family that is correct I imagine that you wanted to tell this story so people understood that something like that can impact you when you're a large landowner. Is, is that right? There was a piece of that, but we also didn't, um, 
again, that negative, I mean, you can fight and, and it'll just kill you. Mm. Um, so there was a part of us that at, at different parts of the, the journey were like, you know, somebody needs to hear this. This is, this is the most ridiculous thing ever. We were just kind of a farm family doing our thing. And how do we get into this chaos? I'm sorry that you had to go through that, but, but at least there's this bright spot that comes out of it because what I'm understanding is that the, the um, natural freedom wellness center was the outcome right. of all of this chaos that was in your life and this almost, you know, near bankruptcy. And then you took your farm and you generate, you created, you shifted gears and you created this, this wellness center to be a service to others in your community. Is that right? Right. Right. And without that experience, we would not be able to offer that. We would not have a full understanding of, you know, um, of experiencing those, the, those challenges of putting food on the table. And now we have that, that experience to draw on. Um, and so, yeah, there was, there is a, a silver lining because um, we've grown in so many different ways and we've learned how to, you know, um, not let our thoughts and our emotions take over and go on, on a merry go ride, you know, and how do we stop and start over just like Ray Hunt, you know, don't, don't push through something bad and hope it gets better when it comes to horses, stop, mm. start over, take that breath. And so along the way, all those different quotes of different horse trainers that, that I had studied for years was part of our journey. You know, I love how you talk about, um, shifting your mindset and like get, getting out of the negative and looking, you know, at the positive. Can you share with me a little bit about how uh, your training and your background in therapeutic riding and then what you're doing now at the wellness center, like how do you, how do you use the horses for this healing and shifting of mindset? One of the stories that I tell in stand up is um, a story that also was in angels on earth. It's a guidepost uh, magazine article. It was about a little paint horse, our Cheyenne. He's in our herd. I was using yoga, <laughs> believe it or not, to try to reboot myself. Um, and I would go out to the barn when I was working with the horses and use the different breathing styles with the horses and watching their nonverbal feedbacks of, you know, which breath they liked, which one was relaxing. Um, and one day my husband was having a really bad day with all the inspections and he was really giving up. And I said, come on, we're going out to the to the pasture and he was just like I can't barely put one foot in front of the other I just want to give up like and I made him walk to the flat behind our barn and the horses were out in the field and um, little Cheyenne he we sat down Indian style I was rubbing his temples trying to help him relax his blood pressure was sky high we were having a lot of blood they wanted to hospitalize him we didn't have insurance so not leaving me we're going to get through this so we were doing aromatherapy and I was massaging and um, so this little paint horse came over and put his muzzle on his head as I was massaging and we're sitting Indian style. And this is years ago. This was, uh, 15 years ago at the time, you know, you don't go sitting around horses, but I, we were so beat down that we were like, just stay breathing, breathe. And he stayed with him with his muzzle on his head for 45 minutes. And if another horse came over to our spot, he would pin his ears, run him off and then come back and come right back to his head and mm -hmm. just stay with him. Um, and I'll never forget afterwards. He just, he got when after that 45 minutes was up, he, he nonchalantly walked over, returned to grazing. And my husband looked up and tears in his eyes running down his cheek. And he said, I've, I have never felt better in my life. I felt like a hundred pounds just got lifted. It was like somebody actually helped me take the burden off of me. So, oh, yeah. What a beautiful story. Uh, oh my gosh. And yeah, the healing power of horses. It's, uh, it's, it's almost magical and kind of unexplainable to be able to bring that together. It's like they take, take the weight off of you just in their way of being. It's like really incredible. And I love that you're, taking those experiences and then now sharing them with your community. So, and you, you mentioned that you work with uh, families at risk. So I, I assume that you have, maybe do you have like government funding or grants or, I mean, how, how does one 
a family that's at risk learn about your services and, and how do they get in, get involved and take advantage of this like beautiful experience that you're offering for healing with horses? So one of the contracts that we've developed, partnerships that we've developed is with a local um, mental health agency. And so it is treatment based because we've combined the, the, the research science for um, the trauma and um, neglect. Um, and we've combined that with our equine experience and we've created this see within model and it goes back to that that first piece of all of our program is starting with that centered breath so for instance if a um if a youth is um kind of challenged with focus because of adhd then we're helping um, use that breath to create the gap between their thought and their, their wanting to react that's gonna get them into trouble. We're creating a gap between the thought and the action by using a breath. And we'll use that, um, that breath and the horse gives that nonverbal feedback and it's non-judgmental. So the, hor so the child is, a, the youth is going, you know, it's not putting them in shame that they did something wrong, you know, like stop doing that or, quit moving and you know um, but more it's more about relationships and building that relationship with your horse do you think he likes it if you take a, a, a breath and slow down and ask to join a space with your you know by moving slower well let's try that so it's a, not a non-judgment it's, it's a non-judgment um, and they get to explore it in a safe place I like that and I, I really see some of the uh, like um, practice like yoga practices and I see some meditation in there too and then I love how it's circling to unite with the horse so mm -hmm. so you work with so this is this is like a prescribed uh, practice or session service for for people who are for children who are seeing mental health advisors is that correct so they so they then will recommend you because you partner together to do additional work with with maybe at this at-risk child is that how it works correct we have 85 to 90 percent is a treatment oriented medically necessary um service mm -hmm. with a, um with a, a mental health provider we have a clinical supervisor that that kind of makes sure that we follow the protocol um the the counselors provide the goal and then we're we're providing a skill based on our time with the horses that helps meet that goal that then helps address their, their treatment. Um, so yes, it is, it is a, that's 85 to 90% of our, of our services is a treatment based program. The rest is a, a empowerment, confidence building, um, just feeling stronger, more confident with while using um, activities with the horse. I love that. And, and this is not just for, children this is for adults for families for for anyone that is wants to deal with something that they're dealing with but also wants to like you said empower themselves around their thoughts utilizing the horse as a piece of that puzzle is that right correct we serve um age three to 93 and it, we just adapt it and modify it according to the needs of the individual it's very individual driven so a, a three-year-old we'd be working on taking three long deep breaths before we enter the barn so we don't scare the horses but um, an adult it, it'll maybe would be more um, mindfulness and um, slow breaths by using the neck and and just slowing everything down um, we created a heart-to-heart -heart rainbow and imagery experience um, that came from our experiences before and we use it to um, help abuse and neglect um, build that relationship that we're working on relationship skills and how to connect with another being and we start with the horse and then hopefully we make that transition to others that is so beautiful i mean thank you for the powerful work that you're doing in your community and then I imagine that people want to, that want to learn more, not just about what led you to creating the center, but also kind of how your work works. Will they find that in your memoir? Will they, will they get a better understanding for how your, your therapy sessions work and what you offer? Um, the, at the end of Stand Up, we outline the, the See Within model, which is the model that we utilize in our sessions. It might vary according to the need, but mm -hmm. um, at least, it, and it gives some of the research and the science behind some of that. And so that gives a, a, a rich 
a rich experience and rich resources that you can explore it even further. Um, my husband and I are working on a second book that would probably give a little bit more of that. <laughs> That's wonderful. What can people expect the follow up, do you think? Ugh. We're hoping this year, but it, it's tough. Yeah, well, you know, writing, <laughs> writing is a journey in and of itself. And, you know, you like, I never give hard, uh, hard timelines of when I don't have something available because, you know, the writing process takes something, it really takes something to, to get these books into the world. So, but I'm excited that you're working on that. <laughs> the hardest part we're finding is we're, it's two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, his is from a perspective of the death of American uh, farm spirit and, you know, how that journey kind of happened in, and, and, perspective of losing that that passion mm -hmm. um and mine then of course i'm all I, I bring a lot more of the training and my as we were going along the process i was thinking about okay if i was if i was working with a horse here what would i do mm. and so then we brought those kind of um, experiences a, a lot more we're working on um that next book being deeper in, into those kind of I like that. Scenarios. So looking for the parallels around what's been going on and then how horses can have an impact on that. Right. 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 I love that. I love exactly. that. Yeah. So let me ask you, you know, like kind of tying this all up with the bow, you know, mm -hmm. when, when someone reads your memoir, uh, stand up, what message do you, do you hope that they are left with, um, when they finish reading your book? I would hope that they would see that there's hope and you can, and belief that there is a better tomorrow, whatever anybody's going through today. Um, it, it, we can, we all have our power within to dig deep and it, one step at a time, move past those hurdles and use it as a gift instead of um, a, a negative because um, I think everybody has their own personal journey and we all have experiences that we wish you didn't have um, but if we can use those in a positive way and, and learn from the lessons I feel like that's um, that's what I'm hoping they will receive from this book um, and and of course the power of the, the healing power of the horse oh, uh, yeah. yeah I love that and that that's wonderful I mean I think that there's a saying out there that says there are no problems in life. There's only situations to manage, right? And, and that's right. what you're speaking to here. You know, there's a, a, a we can persevere. You just got to take one baby step at a time. And, and our furry friends always help with that journey, right? <laughs> and one of the things I have to share with you too is I, I think I would recommend in that for somebody to move past is to create a vision board. A vision board was uh, one of our key things to get through this too. I created where I wanted to go instead of where we were. And every day I made myself look at that board, say some positive I am statements of, you know, I am strong. I, I, I am confident. I can do this. I will take one step towards a goal that you're working on. And um, that is key, I think, too. Um, so hopefully people can use that, the stand up as, as, kind of motivation to say, yes, I can. There's a lot of, there's a lot of power on positive affirmation. I, I really, really believe in that. So um, thank you for sharing, sharing that. Everybody make a vision board immediately. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and over your shoulder, you also, there's a children's book back there that links to your, your center. Do you want to talk a little bit about, about that book there? Yes. Um, so one of the things that, like I said, we, we pride ourselves in is collaborating with professionals in our community. One of the speech therapists involved had asked if she could write a story and, and give it to Natural Freedom and to help with a socio-emotional story for, um, for kids. So we have a story on all of our um, horse members, and it's all a socio-emotional lesson. And then we have... Um, counselors that have, are writing probing questions in the back so that we can continue that conversation with our youth because they're they're working with through some really difficult things sometimes mm -hmm. and in the conversation what we found in our services is sometimes it's just really hard for adults and kids to have a co hard conversation um, so we're hoping that that will bridge um, this will give a storyline that will then bridge and we can talk about 
some of these, you know, bullying and I don't feel confident and I feel like I'm not doing well in school or um, Nikki's story is about how she's small, but she still has a purpose in life. Um, because even though the horses, other horses are bigger than her, um, she had, she saves the day. So I won't Aww. give that up, but, um, <laughs> I love and it. we're, yeah, and we're currently, this is um, illustrated by Mar- Maureen, Maureen Shulo, and so we're very blessed to see, um, or to have her a part of our team as well. And the pictures and, are beautiful. We're, we're actually <laughs> going to be, I'm actually going to be speaking with Maureen uh, yeah. here on the show as well, so we can talk about her beautiful yeah. illustrations, but, and I, I really like the idea of the story facilitating conversation between adults and children. I think that that is, is so smart um, because it's, it's, it makes it, it gives common ground to relate. Is mm-hmm. that, that's right? Right, right. I love that. Um, just to have that conversation. Sometimes it's hard. And, and so, yeah, if we, any tools we can give to help our youth, I think it's important right now. That's great. And are there more uh, children's books in the future, do you think, for, for your program? <laughs> We are working on Amika's story now, mm-hmm. um, and hers is about separation anxiety, and she's a, um, a nurse in our that we adopted from Last Chance Corral, um, and she, we adopted her at three days old, so she has some things that, um, you know, kind of work, she's worried a lot, um, so some of that, those connections, and then the next one is Williams, and he is big and tall, and he can do it all. So, ah, uh, how do you reach your readers? I know you said you were new, you were new to the author journey. So, like, what what has worked best for you in in getting the word out about your books? Um, the social media is one, but I think the best one has been well. The, the, we I presented at Equine Affair in 2017, so that was um, that was a good venue, and of course the Equus Film Festival has been amazing. Um, mm-hmm. It's been an amazing journey, and just being a part of this this whole experience and learning from you guys and and fellow authors. <laughs> well, I think you're doing very well, and you know you're doing the right things, and being at Equine Affair, that's a that's a major space to talk about the work you're doing, which is a, a great, a great place. You're going to where people are receptive to the healing power of horses, which is really, mm-hmm. really smart. Uh, and then, you know, obviously that's why I created this podcast to help other authors learn from other authors. So I think it's great when we unite and we share our knowledge and we help each other out. And that's what we're here for, you know? So thank you for being a part of, of the author community, the equine author community. <laughs> it's a powerful yeah. bunch. Yeah, I really appreciate all the, all the willingness to share your, your wisdom and your knowledge. So. Of course, like, you know, that's what I'm all about. I like helping other people achieve their dreams and get the message out about really powerful work that they're doing for others. And, and you deserve that. A- absolutely. Thank you. So, um, I always like to ask these questions because I think there's a lot of learning available in, you know, hearing different authors' perspectives. So for you, what is the hardest thing about being an author? And then on the flip side, what's the best part about being an author? The easiest part was writing. Mm. I mean, it, I think I, I just watched a podcast where you were talking about how you feel like there's a book in any, every book one you just had to let it flow through that's right and that I that was the experience I had with stand-up um it just flowed but the hardest part was realizing that that's just the beginning not the end like Mm -hmm. I thought writing the book now I'm done (laughs) but you know that's that's great because I, I I do think what you said is true a lot of people talk about how hard it is but I think the hardest part about writing a book is sitting down and actually doing the writing. Like once you sit down and you begin the process, then it can flow through you. Uh, I, Stephen, I talk about this book all the time, but Stephen King's on writing, he talks about how the hardest moment is just before you start. It's like get, getting mm-hmm. over that hurdle of just sitting down to, to do the work, to do the writing. Do, do you have that experience? And that's the, 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 the motivator for me was the fact that I, that, that I was accepted to be a presenter at Equine Affair and I wanted to take something to kind of validate the experience and have it in, it was in my head and I was like, what a perfect opportunity to get it on paper. 
So that kind of motivated me to actually sit down and do it. Um, so yeah, I would agree with that. And I needed that, that um, venue to kind of force me to, to sit down. Otherwise it was just kind of rolling around in my head. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that, that, ha that happens to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so what's been the best part of the experience of being an author for you? The best part has been this experience right here. Nice to be a part of a herd of, of creative people um, that are very kind and willing to share their knowledge. And what's even better is um, the families that we serve are watching this journey with us. They're take going on this journey. So seeing that um, as Brene Brown says, you know, with the vulnerability and, you know, I'm, I'm, this is scary because this is out of my normal. Um, and so we use this in our sessions, you know, and we say, hey, look, this, this was scary, but um, moving into something new can be, it, it's worth it. Um, so you guys have been amazing, not only for me and my family, but for all of our families in Southeast Ohio that are following along. So. Oh, that's wonderful. And I love Brene Brown and, you know, being vulnerable, there's mm -hmm. a lot of growth on the other side of vulnerability. So I'm so proud of you for taking this on and, and, you know, even though it's scary and moving through it and you're, look at, look at the fantastic outcome though, you know, here you are, you've got two books behind you, you've won an award, you're getting your message out to the community, you're doing great work and people are learning about you and you just, that's putting yourself out there is, you know, probably 99.9% .9 of, of the game. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. And true. then just so I was clear, did you, you said the hardest part was not the writing, but what comes after, right? Being prepared for everything that happens after you've written the book from, you know, cover design to working with an editor to, you know, putting it out there in the world to the marketing of, of the package. Did I get that right? I just want to make sure we covered that. Well, the cover design was um, done by my daughter, Leticia. So she took care of that. That wasn't hard. She's a great photographer and she did a wonderful job putting it together. Um, and the editor wasn't too bad because I have friends in, in, that could help. Um, but it's, it's the fact that what do you do now? Yeah, it's the marketing, it's the, um, you know, like, how do you, where do you go, you know, from here, mm -hmm. um, and what's next? So, yeah, I think that's been the hardest part for me, not realizing, like I said, I thought, oh, it's done, we're, you know, yay, yeah, it, but that's, that's not the case, that's just the beginning of the journey, really. Mm -hmm. So there's a learning curve. There's a there was a big learning curve after after you had gotten the words on the page, um, right? Yeah. And you're never done marketing a book. It's a it's a constant you know thing that that is always happening out there in, in the world and getting your message out. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you this too because I you know I love this conversation about being vulnerable and getting uncomfortable and you know trying new things because you've you've got this mission or this dream you want to share uh, with others to to improve their lives right so what would what advice would you give to someone who wants to achieve his or her dreams like writing a book or starting a business like a therapeutic uh, equine or a equine therapeutic center or you know just even taking a horseback riding or something that they wanted to do what advice would you give someone on you know how to achieve their dreams um, I think that's where that vision board would come into play, mm -hmm. sitting down and creating, you know, what is it that you really are looking for? Because we can get busy to our, in our day to day, you know, the have tos, the could have, should have, you know, that whole, I, I need to, um, and we can get in on that gerbil wheel, um, you know, <laughs> but, um, but making yourself, you know, ask the question, what are my dreams and how, and taking one step towards that every single day, whether it is, getting on um, and sending one email out, whether it's, you know, um, making a list of, you know, where you're going to go with it, um, you know, just one step every single day and, and not giving up on yourself. Hmm. I think that's fantastic advice. What makes you feel like your best self or most inspired? I feel like if I can empower people to think past their their current situation or think past their obstacles or their hurdles that that gives me that gives me joy that that wake that gets me um up every morning to say you know what we can do this as as a as humanity help help um boost one another and feel empowered to 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 live their best life to be mm -hmm. authentic and 
Well, that's, yeah. that's beautiful. And that is certainly a reason to get out of bed in the morning, helping people <laughs> advance their lives forward. I think that's beautiful. So what are you curious about right now? Like what's next for you? What's next for the wellness center? Like what, what, what are you, where it's on your vision board? Where are you heading? <laughs> Ah, well, th this year for Natural Freedom, we have a lot of really new programs that um, that I'm excited about. We're going to um, do more yoga with horses mm. um, and yoga on the hillside. Um, and we're we're bringing Maureen, um, the artist for, for Nikki's story here. She's coming down and she's um, from Canada and she's going to be doing an art um an art here, an art program with our youth and doing some hands-on and figuring out how to draw and, and create flipboards and um, real exciting things. Um, our goal would be for that is to show the, our youth that the, what's out there in the world, how can we expect them to move past where they're at if they don't know what it, there is. Um, so we're pretty excited about having her down and starting a new program, um, you know, to kind of use the art as a platform to, to empower. Like I said, we're, Robert and I are working towards our second book. Um, it, the hard part there is finding, uh, the times. You're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the one, that's the one thing. I get that one thing done every day, but, for, and it sounds like the future is so bright and I love that you're bringing Maureen in and power of creativity through art and, you know, working with the horses. And I had one question about horse yoga. So I, I think I'm a big fan of Heartland. I, I love that show. It's great. Yes. I think they had, a, they had an episode where, where there was an instructor doing horse yoga and she was literally doing a downward dog on the horse's back. Is it, are you talking like that kind of yoga or are you working next to it? Like, what does your horse yoga look like? I'm so curious. Um, so we put a barrier with Cavalettis around the middle of the arena and um, we're inside there and then the horses are on the outside. Um, okay, so it's so like we don't do yoga on horseback. We do <laughs> with. <laughs> I was curious about that. I, I, I love that. So it's so like it's like almost like a syncing up with their energy and the breath work while you're doing the yoga. So it's not like goat yoga where they jump on on you or and it's not like mm -hmm. where you're doing yoga on their back so it's like a very it's like a peaceful setting and you're right. you're separated from the horses but they are still there okay right i right. yeah i'm just my <laughs> head went all over the place with with horse <laughs> yoga so and i would love to, to participate in that that sounds really amazing if you are always welcome we would love to have you Oh, thank you for the invitation. So we'll have to make that happen. Um, so speaking of, you know, the programs that you have up and coming and the work that you're already doing, can you tell people where they can find uh, your books and then more about uh, your wellness center? Wellness center, it's naturalfreedomohio.com. You can find our website. We're on Facebook, uh, Natural Freedom Wellness Center. Stand Up is on Amazon and there's a Facebook page for um, Pam Jeffers as well. So. Oh, great. And I will link to all those places in the show notes so people can get to you directly. And I'll be sharing some pictures of Pam and the work that she does. And, and there'll be more information about her in the show notes. And Pamela, I really appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you for talking about all of the powerful work you're doing and the healing power of horses and, and really showcasing that message that no matter what you're going through, there's something on the other side. You just have to keep pushing forward. And I love the vision board conversation. So thank you so much for the gift of your time today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes and make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle.